and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about books that provoke conversation and conversations about books. Every episode, we sit down to chat about the two books read most recently by our book clubs. What did we make of them? Did they spark debate? And whether we loved them or loathed them, the big question is always, were they great book club books? Our two books this month are The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin, a sci-fi feminist classic about a human alien on a planet called Winter, and Secondhand Time by Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexievich, a lyrical series of interviews with Russians grappling with life in a post-Soviet world. And we'll be catching up with our latest guest book clubber, finding out what their book club means to them and their favourite reads. Stay tuned. All that and more coming up on the Book Club Review. So let's start off with The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin. I had never heard of this book. Your book club chose it for your last meeting. How did you come to choose this one? Well, you know how we have talked in the past about steering our book clubs towards specific choices. Uh, In this case, I don't think it was so much a steer as a kind of dictatorial decision. Um, We wanted to read something a bit different than what we'd read recently. So I suggested we read something by Ursula Le Guin, particularly one of her science fiction novels. So, The Left Hand of Darkness. It's the story of a human alien on a planet called Winter. And that human alien is Genli Ai, and he's a solitary envoy sent to make first contact with the humans of Winter. Genli himself is a human, um, and basically, many, many uh, thousands of years ago, humans uh, populated planets across the universe, but then technology, I guess, broke down and they, and they lost contact with one another. So now some of these planets have been in touch for a long time. They're bound together by a council called the Acumen. And Genli has been sent out to make contact with Winter and the human population on that planet. It's nice to hear you, how you pronounce this name there, because at one point it's referred to in the, in the context of the story. Someone points out that the way you pronounce his name is like a cry of pain. Which oh. in my head I, I read as, I <laughs> yeah, Interesting. And I think I called it, uh, call him Genli I, possibly because one of the books we read recently and discussed recently, The Sellout, that character's last name is me. Yes. And I tried to make this point to, in book club, actually. I said, does anyone think there's any significance in the fact that his name, his last name is I? And everyone just stared blankly at me. One of the things that's quite appealing about this book is the way that she's thought through everything so carefully. And even to the way that the inhabitants of Winter have trouble pronouncing Genli I because they can't say their L's. So they tend to say Genri. And just those little details, but it's what makes it all seem so much more real. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a wonderful depiction of a civilization and culture that is very different to ours and yet manages to seem incredibly true to what we know about humans and human nature. So there's two fundamental differences, isn't there? One, that they live on this ice planet and so their civilization has adapted to enable them to survive in these conditions. And the other is to do with their sexuality, which is a very interesting difference. Their biology almost, which is that they only present as male or female at certain times of the month when they almost go into heat and that's the moment when they can procreate and um, and it's called kemmering and when two Gethenians, the planet is also called Gethen, winter or Gethen, two Gethenians come together they present in a, either as male or female and then are able to reproduce. And so she plays with this idea of gender in a really interesting way throughout the whole book. So Genli is male as we would think of him. He is a conventional human as we know them. And he goes to this planet where everyone is in this strangely gender neutral state. Mm. And they call him, they consider him a pervert. That's right. <laughs> and and there are, they, there's a moment where they explain that there are indivi- there are humans like him on this planet, maybe four or 5% of the population, and they're tolerated, but they are considered perverted. I think the perception is that they constantly have sex on the mind, whereas Gethenians only have sex on the mind at a certain period of the month, and that's, you know, they almost go away, retreat from society, procreate, and that's that, and then they come back and are very civilized. And so she has to kind of find a way around the problem of how she describes the people that Genli interacts with. And she tends to use the pronoun he 
almost exclusively. And it is, it does make it a bit disorienting because we know that these human beings are not men. And at the same time, because the pronoun is constantly he, it's a bit tricky. One of my book club members, Caitlin, said she struggled with this book for a few reasons, but one of them was that she just didn't feel like there were any women in it whatsoever. And she's like, I understand that they're supposed to be gender neutral, but they don't come across as gender neutral to me. I just considered them men. I thought the same, but then... The kind of wonderful thing is when at the very end of the book, he does call his mothership, which has been Mm -hmm. orbiting in the solar system around this planet, waiting for him. So he is an envoy. He has been sent as the first contact and he goes to the planet and his job is to try and make contact with them and open them up to the possibility that there are other civilizations on other planets who are reaching out to them. But so in the end, he, he does call the ship down and the people who come off it are female and there is then this wonderful moment of surprise and unfamiliarity from him but also mm. from you the reader because by that point it's, it's it's a reasonably long book you fly through it but it is quite a long novel by that point you've become so accustomed to this way of thinking about these gender neutral individuals that, that the, the presence of a real female is suddenly qu- almost shocking so I, I felt like perhaps that was something that she had calculated and that was inten- intentional I think everything in this book was so intentional and that was uh, where many of us ended up in our discussion was that we almost wanted to reread it because it's so rich and the depiction of this society and the, the exploration of character it's very slow to get started. She doesn't explain the world to you in the first two chapters. There's little hints dropped throughout the entirety of the novel. And it's only when you get to the end that it begins to fully come together. And at the same time, you know you've missed a lot and you want to go back to the beginning to pick things up again. What did they think then? Did they think it was a good read? I was nervous because it was my choice. And uh, we have a WhatsApp group where we message each other. And I read, I think, maybe the first third and was like, oh, this is a bit dry, a bit slow. So, uh, but I, I kept going and, um, and it really does pick up, but maybe, a, yeah, I think about a third of the way in. And so I was messaging them being like, keep going guys, really, it does, it does get good, keep going. And, and they did. And so most people, most people had finished it, which I thought was a pretty good effort because not everyone likes science fiction. And the people who had finished it came to love it just like me. So that was really pleasing. What did you think? I felt the same. I, I think absolutely it's a slow start. It comes to life through one of the characters and he's the only character you really get to know and in a way it, because you see him through Genli's eyes Genli eyes eyes <laughs> you get to know him in that way but then his own voice comes through you there are chapters from his point of view and you read his journals and you start to understand what makes him tick and the more you understand what makes him tick the more you like him the more you care about him and you become very gradually but quite profoundly invested in these two characters and this relationship between them and then they go on this wonderfully epic journey across the ice fields they have to traverse this ice field sort of 700 mile it's journey. amazing but why is that so good why is the story of two i can't say men two people pushing a sled across an ice field so captivating i i, I asked myself that but it was i think it's credit to her writing she writes in almost a slightly old-fashioned way that could be seen as just kind of pushing plot but she manages to create incredible characters and a real sense of place that you build up these very very strong mental images of the landscape and when she describes that glacier and the the mountain tops poking out some of them are just mountains some of them are volcanoes you know spewing um, lava and um, and ash into the air and you can see it and you can feel it yeah it's incredibly vivid and, and the cold and constant descriptions of what that would feel like I had expected perhaps that there would be more around the theme of gender and that she would explore that more overtly than she does because she does it in a very subtle way. So one of the interesting things about the society, for example, is that there is conflict, Mm -hmm. but there is never war. Mm -hmm. And the inference is that this is because they have this gender neutral society and that somehow that stops things tipping over into the aggression and drive for dominance that we traditionally associate more with men. But it's all done in quite a subtle, quite a gentle way. She she never really rams it home. That's why I worry a little bit about dubbing it a feminist sci-fi classic because it it is. But that could put some people off, and actually, you can you could read it quite straight, I think, without getting too much into the gender politics. It feels much more like she's just exploring an idea in an incredibly rich and imaginative way. That's very satisfying. You know, it's satisfying to explore it with her. 
I wanted to read a short piece from towards the end of the book. So this is a moment when Estrovan and Genli are in a tent and they're trying to understand one another and the, the reason why Genli has been sent to winter alone. And Estrovan asks, why? Why did you come alone? Why were you sent alone? Everything still will depend upon that ship coming. Why was it made so difficult for you and for us? And Genli responds, It's the Acumen's custom, and there are reasons for it. Though in fact I begin to wonder if I've ever understood the reasons. I thought it was for your sake that I came alone, so obviously alone, so vulnerable, that I could in myself pose no threat, change no balance. Not an invasion, but a mere messenger boy. But there's more to it than that. Alone I cannot change your world, but I can be changed by it. Alone I must listen as well as speak. It's quite a reassuringly positive view of the universe. Very often sci-fi, particularly films, but novels as well, when alien contact comes, it's normally a kind of malign, we're under threat, we have to band together to fight to save the planet. And I rather like the idea of this ecumen, this alliance of world. It's more like the Star Trek Federation idea, you know, of a benevolent force reaching out (laughs) to civilizations across the galaxy to try and bring them into the fold so that they can share and learn from each other and everyone's happier. With what seemed to be a very practical angle, which is that because time travel results in such a a jump forward in time, you can't go to war with one another. You know, you you would leave your planet, arrive somewhere else 17 years later, you might try and then go to back 17 years late, well, get entangled up by just even talking about it. So the acumen exists really to create trade and knowledge and understanding. So Was it a good book club book? Yes. It was? Yes, yes, it definitely was. It was fun in and of itself, just kind of urging each other on and everyone was sort of laughing about that. Some people didn't like it. Hilariously, my friend Caitlin, who didn't like it, said she she found it very frustrating that they never get into the detail of Kemmering. So what happens when these people meet? I don't know how she could say that, though, because there's that whole separate section at the end. So where she... Did she not read that bit? No one read that book. Oh, because that bit. it comes after the boring chapter about the um, the Gethanian clock system, which I have to say I skipped. So <laughs> I thought, I don't need to know this. So you don't even know this. That's not part of the book. That is only on the Kindle edition. Ah. So some people, exactly, they responded like you and were like, what are you talking about? There's, There's a this- whole chapter where she goes into it in great detail. Exactly. But most of us hadn't read that. I still haven't. Well, how odd then, but so that wasn't in the original print copy that you have on your lap right there? No. And so, but then what, did she add that in? Because people were, cons- she probably had letters from people saying, love the book, but what, I just didn't understand the mechanics of Kenmering. Can you explain it more? And so <laughs> she's happens- like, okay, I'll write another chapter. And, and my understanding is that's what uh, explains what happens when they enter puberty and they're introduced. So you haven't read it? No. Oh, it's lovely. It's very nice. It's, yeah. It's very sweet because it's about a girl sorry, a person who is effectively going through puberty and attaining the state in which you chema for the first time. I'm saying her as a female because when you go into the chema house, the first person who makes physical contact with you will affect the gender that you will become. And so in this instance, her first contact is a man. So then she takes on the female form or yeah, she morphs into the female form. And then that's her first chemering as a female. So that's why she, I have this idea of her as, as she. But of course, after the period of, is complete, she goes back to the gender neutral person that she was. And there's a nice little story about her future life. And it's just really lovely. It was very, I did wonder, it did seem to me strangely out of place. I, I did think to myself, why is this here? So that's, gosh, how intriguing. No wonder people were confused. <laughs> well, exactly. And then we all wanted to read that story. We were like, oh, that sounds, that sounds like that was the good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, you could read just that. And I think you probably have quite a satisfying experience. So yes, in conclusion, it was a good book club book. Yes. And quite an exciting introduction for some people to science fiction. Okay, so there you go. The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin. But just make sure that you read the Kindle edition rather than the print version, because that has all the good stuff. Now, Laura and I love our book clubs, but we also love hearing about other people's. In this interview, I talked to someone who I've known since childhood about what her book club means to her. I'm Anne Thompson. I live in Wheatonstead. I've lived here for 56 years. I'm 88. I've been going to this book club for 10 years. 
Can you tell me how it works? So firstly, how often do you meet? About once a month. And when you get together, what are the sort of mechanics of it? We arrive at eight o'clock. We have a cup of coffee. We chat a bit, but not too long because we do most of our chatting at the end when we finish talking about the book. And does the person who suggested the book, do they introduce the book? Is there someone who sort of manages the discussion? People suggest books and if the person who runs the book club accepts them, they will ask them if they'll introduce it. If they don't want to introduce it, they try and find somewhere else or else June, who runs the book, introduces it herself. So that sounds like, does something have to meet with June's approval before it's accepted that it will be the book that you read? Yes, indeed, because there are some subjects, June knows this all very well, there are some subjects that she doesn't want to touch because there are people who she knows might be upset about them, like children dying young and this sort of thing. So she's very careful about not upsetting any of the members who are all her old friends. Perhaps I'd better say here how the book club is run. We're all old. Um, I should think the youngest person is about 75. It's very much the person who, who runs it is in charge, and she knows who's going to introduce it. And then the person who's, who's introducing it talks about the book. Some people have done a lot of research on the internet and have more to say than others. And she'll read extracts from reviews and things. She won't usually read extracts from the book, but sometimes she does if it ties in with, with reviews she's been reading. And she'll usually talk for a quarter of an hour or so. And then it's, it's open to discussion and everybody else joins in and says what they've liked or what asks questions about things they haven't understood. And this goes on for another half hour or so. Do you have a favourite book that you've read for your book club? I love them. I love them all. I think the one I've enjoyed most this year has been The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Mung. What did you like about it? It was just different. It it was mythical. It's about this child in, in America who runs away from her father, going with her old nanny who was black, and they turn up at this farm with these three black sisters who raise bees and she gets involved with them and she lives with them because they have nowhere to go. She's supposed to be looking for some relation but she doesn't really know where the relation lives and she gets really adopted by them. It's a quirky story but it's different and lovely. And it all connects up. And did it make for a good book club book? Was it a good discussion book? Very good, very good, yes. Um, there's lots to talk about. Did people tend to agree with you or was it good because people felt differently about it? We all agreed and we all loved it. We don't often disagree. Sometimes people haven't read the book and so they're just listening to what's being said. Sometimes people have said in advance that they don't like this particular author. So maybe they just come and join in and listen to what's going on. Is there anything you can think of that you've read, someone's perhaps suggested that you really haven't liked? I don't think so. Not in, not in recent memory. I wasn't very keen on Don Jordan's King's Bed Sex Pa in the Court of Charles, but it was okay. It sounds like it would be good. <laughs> Is that non fiction? Yes. Well, it's sort of semi semi. No, it's non fiction, yeah. Um, I can't remember it very clearly, but that's why I say I didn't like it very much because it's the only one that hasn't really lived. A very great memory. Do you find, is it quite a nice way of getting you to read things that you wouldn't normally read? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's, it gives me ideas for things. In fact, I've got a whole sheet of paper here of things that were suggested. We had. We do have, once a year, we have a time discussing books we've read. Um, oh, yes. I find it difficult to think what to read. If people tell me something, I write it down and I read it. But yes, it's great. I read books that I wouldn't have thought about otherwise. So for you, it's a nice way of finding your way from book to book. Oh, yes. Definitely, very much. Mm. And finding out what kind of books I like. I'm, I'm sort of dying to see what's on these lists of yours. What's on this well, list? That's the list of ones that, were, that was when we had this big discussion the other day about books shared. That was in August, you see. That was wonderful, but we haven't read it. Everybody had read that. Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. I'd never heard of the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peeling Society by Ma Ann. Oh, you must! It is hilarious! <laughs> Tell me about that. Oh, gosh. It's written by an American, and it's happening in Guernsey in the wall. 
and the Germans are there, and the Germans don't like them meeting together, so they say they are discussing the, their, they've got this potato peel society they're going to discuss about cooking and things. And it's it's about the family, it's about the people who are living there, it's about the children, and it's it's very funny and it's delightful and it's very touching. I've never heard of it. I will I will try to read it. I don't know where it is, right? Don't you have it? And it sounds like you have quite a nice mix between fiction and non fiction. We have a great mix. I mean I think that's why June's quite clever. We all say things, suggest books, and she tries to keep it mixed between biography, fiction, stories. Um, so that we're never doing the same thing time and time again. Yeah, I think that's nice. I, like, I think it's nice to mix it up. So that was Anne Thompson. Laura, what did you make of her? I thought Anne sounded great. Uh, she has the disposition a little bit of maybe a school teacher. Is that true? You have to imagine she lives in this house that is not totally lined with books, but they have this wonderful living room and that is lined with books. And she lives there with her husband, Michael. They live a, a, a life that's very connected to books and reading. He can't read himself any longer. His eyesight isn't up to it. And so she reads to him. That's very sweet. Sometimes I read to my husband, but he falls asleep. It's, it's not a very rewarding experience. I found it um, fascinating that her definition of a good book club book was one where they all agreed and all loved it. Yes, it's nice, isn't it? It's sort of the opposite of what we've said before. But yeah, she obviously finds that very satisfying and, and rewarding. And I, can, and I can see why. I always think when you agree with everyone, though, then there's less perhaps to discuss. Have you read The Secret Life of Bees? I never have. And I like that. I was like, oh, yeah, that does sound good. She, she sort of sold it to me. Uh, also, the revelation of that conversation for me was the Guernsey... The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, I think. By Mary Ann Schaefer on her list. I I read it as Ma Ann, but Mary Ann Schaefer. I've Um, read that book twice. Is it any good? Yeah, it's really nice. She obviously really loved it. I'd never heard of it. I couldn't believe it. It's letters between all the different characters that kind of weave together what's happening in their lives and the friendships between them, the romance. You have to have a bit of a romance, I think, for a really, really satisfying read. I have uh, I have downloaded it on my Kindle. I think it might be a good antidote to secondhand time. That's what I thought for The Secret Life of Bees, for the same reason. The other thing I found quite inspiring about Anne's book club is the way that it keeps her connected socially. She mentioned that she can't drive anymore, but someone now comes to collect her and takes her to the book club once a month. And that idea of sort of regular social contact, but also the idea of a pile of books that she works her way through and... Uh, just everything about it sounded great. I thought, oh, yeah, I hope when I'm 88, I'm still going to my book club. Me too. Me too. And so we turn to our next book, Secondhand Time by Svetlana Alexievich. Alexievich won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2015. That was in recognition of her five books, which stitched together Soviet and Russian history through first-person accounts of those she interviews. Secondhand Time is her most recent book, It was translated into English in 2016. Kate, why don't you tell us a bit about it? Secondhand time is history, but it's not quite like any history I've ever read before. As you said, it's a collection of interviews with people from all walks of life. And the thing that these people have in common is that they all grew up under the Soviet regime. In Russia, these people are known as Sovoks. And Alexievich is able to get these extraordinarily frank, very confessional interviews from people, I think primarily because she's one of them. But she was born in 1948. She grew up under this regime. And, and this is her world. She understands this world. She understands this life. And as a result, the interviews are two people speaking to each other about something that is very known and understood. But through that, you get this extraordinary insight into what life was like. If I just read from the introduction, because I think Alexievich puts it very beautifully when she just introduces the book, what she's trying to do. The Soviet civilization. I'm rushing to make impressions of its traces, its familiar faces. I don't ask people about socialism. I want to know about love, jealousy, childhood, old age. Music, dances, hairdos, the myriad sundry details have a vanished way of life. It's the only way to chase the catastrophe into the contours of the ordinary and to try to tell a story, make some small discovery. It never ceases to amaze me how interesting everyday life really is. There are an endless number of human truths. History is concerned solely with the facts. Emotions are outside of its realm of interest. In fact, it's considered improper to admit feelings into history. 
but I look at the world as a writer and not a historian. It's a very compelling introduction and she sets up the book beautifully, I think. And um, We should flag this book is over 700 pages. I'm curious how you decided to choose it for your book club. Well, it was recommended by Andy, who's our newest book club member. And I, I think he's between jobs right now. And I get the impression he has quite a bit of time on his hands, hence recommending um, this 700 page book. But he did actually convince us. He he had read it and he was incredibly enthusiastic about it. And yeah, we, we were kind of persuaded. How many people finished it? Not that many, but... Anyone? Uh, yeah, well, he had obviously read it. And in fact, he read it twice because he, he re- looked at it again um, in order to discuss it. No, I think of the five of us who met that night, two had finished it. Two were sort of significantly, you know, getting through it. And, and I was actually the one who was the most behind. But the reason it works, despite the fact that not everyone had finished it, is because because of the nature of these interviews. And you can actually dip in. You could You could start at the beginning and read it sequentially, or you can just dip in and out. And you would still get this incredible impression it makes on you. So so it, in a way, despite its length, actually, it, it worked fine. I have to admit, I made it to about page 250, and I did enjoy it immensely. But because the interviews are maybe not the 50 pages usually, um, you'd, you'd finish one and you'd want to take a pause. It's not a, a linear journey that your impression of this moment in time and how humans responded to it grows as layer upon layer is added to this book but you could read a few I think and still appreciate the overall book and her approach to history. Yeah I think absolutely you know it's it's not an easy read these are very difficult subjects terrible terrible things happened in Russia and in so many different ways so many different stories from neighbours informing on neighbours and and the tragic consequences of that to children growing up in labor camps and 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 how they survived and i mean just you can't even begin to sort of catalog the 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 horror stories in here but told in this very human way and 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 by people who ultimately survived and just have to just accept that life is what it is and making the best of it it doesn't sound like it's something that would be fun to read and, and indeed it isn't but it's something that's incredibly worthwhile and interesting and powerful and as an example, I know Amanda hadn't read that much of it at book club. She's been away on holiday this week. She's gone off to sunny Sicily. She sent me a picture of beautiful Palermo or somewhere, wherever they are. But she, she mentioned she's still reading Secondhand Time. And uh, and her partner, Joe keeps asking her if she's all right, because Amanda apparently keeps sort of sighing heavily. Because it's the kind of book, it does make you do that. But nonetheless, it's incredibly compulsive. And yeah, you start reading and actually it's quite hard to stop. That's so true, because I was dreading this book when you when you said it was the next read for your book club. But actually, once I sat down to read, you, you just get swept away. Um, it's, it's In a weird way, it is actually a page turner. Yeah, and I don't know quite how she manages to do it. And I'm very interested in how she turns these uh, interviews into such compelling, beautiful language and whether this is coming from the individuals. I mean, it's quite possible that she interviews literally thousands of people and then only cherry picks those individuals who are able to tell their story in such a compelling way. But I, I don't know. I think that is true. I think I read somewhere that I think she's been interviewing people for 20 years. And I mean, her background is journalism. She trained as a journalist. And I think there is a sense, even in this incredibly long book, nonetheless, this is this is very much a selection of different voices. And even within the interviews themselves, you're aware, just because I think intellectually, you know that it must be there, of a sense of editing despite the fact that the mood is actually very much of uncensored, unedited speech that's just pouring forth. But it has to have been worked on a bit. It can't just be verbatim what people said. And in the edit, somehow I think she's allowed those voices to come through in a very pure and sort of strangely unfiltered way. That gentle editing that must surely have been part of the process lifts them up and allows you to really appreciate them. Did you feel, did the book group feel that the voices varied across narrator? Because I, I didn't immediately have that impression and and it's not, uh, it doesn't make me skeptical about the story, not at all. They're still very, the the interviews are still very powerful, but I didn't immediately feel that it was switching to a different person who spoke in a different way. Instead, uh, these individuals almost came to be sort of every man, every woman telling the stories that were universal to all Sovaks. Yeah, I think that's true. I I commented that actually 
I would have appreciated pictures in this book. I felt like for me, that would have helped me really have a clearer sense in my mind's eye of these people as individuals. But I think you're absolutely right. It's like an orchestra, a symphony. You know, there are all these different themes and notes and and moods running through it. And they, they build up to form this comprehensive picture that actually allows you to empathize and understand in a way that I think is quite unique. I've never read anything like it. And I think it's this that won her the Nobel Prize. She effectively has created a new way of recording history. Well, and there were these moments of recognition for me where the Soviet people were responding to something that happened on the global stage. So talking about their pride in defeating Hitler, talking about their pride in having the first man in space, and at the same time their fear of nuclear war... And it just made me think, oh, those are the same um, sources of pride for many people in the West and the same fears for many people in the West at the same time. And it kind of united these very, very different groups of people within world history. Yeah, it allows you to understand, though, what happens to human beings when they are brought up uh, and effectively indoctrinated into a way of thinking that leads them into this blind obedience and faith in this idea of the motherland uh, in the the most extraordinary way, which is really hard to understand. And yet somehow through these interviews and through understanding the way that people were brought up, the way they were raised, the things that they went through, the things they experienced, the things that they were told by their parents, by their teachers, it, it makes sense. And it's tragic. It's so distressing and sad. But it does make sense. And, and I think that understanding is, is the thing that felt so valuable and worthwhile. Yeah, just the level of emotional trauma that has happened to these individuals, either from experiencing atrocities or seeing them firsthand, but also just having the ground kind of pulled beneath them when perestroika happened. And suddenly they, they learned about their history. They learned about Stalin's pogroms and, and the, the gulags. And they just didn't know that such things had existed if they hadn't experienced them. And it's only when perestroika happens and suddenly people are saying things on TV that many people had only ever said in the safety of their kitchens. And there is that beautiful motif of them having these incredibly intense relationships and conversations in their kitchens at night, Mm. even as during the day they would head out into the world and be very good communists. Mm. There's a story about, we discussed it in the book club, few people had picked up on it, two women who lived in an apartment block. One of them had a five-year-old daughter, one of them had no child. The woman with the daughter, they came for her, she was taken away, and she just had time to cry out to to the neighbor, her friend, look after my daughter don't let them take her to an orphanage and so the friend did take the daughter in and after a while the daughter started to call the friend mama and the real mother was gone for 18 years and then she came back and when she came back she threw herself on her friend and kissed her feet and thanked her for for raising her daughter and then they released the records and she was able to go and look and find out who had informed on her and she wanted to know and so she did and she went and she read her file And she found out that the person who had informed on her had been the neighbour. And then she couldn't really deal with that information and she killed herself the next day. And, you know, unfortunately, this book is full of stories like that. It's not even one of the worst, but it's indicative of the level of just strange awfulness that went on. I mean, why would that woman have done that? You know, you'd have to say the only motivation she could possibly have had is that somehow she wanted the child. Maybe, but there is this sense that people were so idealistic as well that if anyone, even if it was a family member, went against kind of communist gut doctrine, actually that was enough to cut the personal ties. You just recounting that story, which I did read, gave me goosebumps because it just sounds so... um, inhumane not even I want to almost say just unhuman you know how could you possibly do that but I was watching an interview uh, with Alexievich this morning and the interviewer was saying you know how can you explain how individuals did this to one another during that time and she said people only hold high moral standards in exceptional circumstances and I think that's true and and she mentioned Nazi Germany as well as another example and I think when when sort of chaos ensues 
actually humans are capable of great, great cruelties to one another. Yeah, I did find this book haunting and also, depending on what mood I was in at the time, just terrifying. I place absolutely no dependence on human beings' inherent goodness. I I feel like now we're all just, if we run out of Jaffa cakes, you know, the next thing that will happen is that we will all turn on each other. It feels like a very thin thread now. (laughs) It's a very bleak, bleak note uh, then to ask. Was it a good book club book? Well, it was and it wasn't. It was an interesting discussion book. It's true, it was too long. I think people struggled to finish it and it always feels a bit frustrating when that happens. But at the same time, it was incredibly worthwhile and rewarding and I think it was a very good example of something that actually it was a good way of the book club getting us to read something that I don't think left to our own devices any of us would have read. I think actually most of us had kind of seen it in bookshops and were aware of it. But I don't think we would have read it if it hadn't been for Andy and doing it for book club. And I think all of us were very glad that we had read it. I also watched an interview with Alexievich in which the interviewer asked her how she did it, how she managed to get those interviews. And she said something I thought was really interesting. She said, "You, you have to get beyond the sorrow and beyond the suffering. You have to get beyond grief. And then you get to what's interesting and what needs to be recorded. And it's an extraordinary thing, but she does manage to do that. And that's what's so profound and so moving about this. She has managed to capture something that it feels impossible that anyone could articulate. But nonetheless, it's there in this book. Perhaps a happy final note uh, is that in that interview I listened to, she mentioned that winning the Nobel Prize almost drew a line under the body of work she's completed to date. And then the book she's working on right now will be composed of interviews about romance and love and, and people's experiences of love. So in many ways, it feels like she's turning a page. And actually, I'm sure that would be a much more just as valuable and intriguing a read, but perhaps a bit lighter. Well, that does sound good. Yes, I didn't know that. Um, it, I think she's amazing. I, I sort of, yeah, I'm fascinated by her and would pretty much read anything that she writes. I think she's, <laughs> she's great. So all in all, an incredible book. Educational, yes. Powerful, yes. But maybe not a book club book. Yeah. It's just, You're on the fence. It was just such a emotionally very difficult book to read you also read it in february yeah in the bleakest months <laughs> <laughs> maybe amanda has the trick of it actually is just to take it somewhere very sunny and beautiful and work through it that way if you had to pick between our two books this episode uh, secondhand time versus the left hand of darkness which do you think you'd recommend well i'm the left hand of darkness was a pleasure to read it was um, great fun secondhand time has affected the way that I think about the world. So I think I would have to say, despite reservations, I would would have to say secondhand time. Oh, interesting. How about you? Which one would you go for? Is it okay to pick your own book? I loved the discussion we had over The Left Hand of Darkness. It was long. It was really engaged. It wasn't nearly as emotional as I imagine it would have been talking about uh, secondhand time. But uh, it led to a lot, a lot of interesting thoughts and, and points. So I would probably pick pick the left hand of darkness. So maybe it's a maybe it's a draw and we leave it to you, listeners, to decide which book would be best for your book group. What to read next is always one of our favourite things to think about. Inspired by today's podcast, here are a few more recommendations you might want to consider for your next book club read. My recommendations are all in the science fiction or fantasy genre. Sci-fi, because Left Hand of Darkness was obviously a science fiction novel. And most of the participants in my book group really wanted to read more sci-fi. It was a genre they weren't aware of. Obviously, they were aware of. They weren't (laughs) familiar with it. They hadn't read much. And so what followed in our WhatsApp group, where we communicate uh, to arrange scheduling and so forth, was a list of science fiction novels none of which I've actually read. So I wanted to see if you've read those. Okay. Okay, so these are, these are the recommendations. Yep. The City and the City by China Mel, Mel, Melville. No, so I've heard of him, but I've never read anything by him. Neither have I. So The City and the City and Kiln People, both by China Melville. Prince of Thorns, King of Thorns, Emperor of Thorns, a trilogy by Mark Lawrence. Nope. Me neither. And Hyperion by Dan Simons. Nope. <laughs> okay, so we cannot tell you, listeners, whether or not these would make a book. But are they, are they any good? I mean, maybe I haven't heard, from, heard of them because no one's really reading them. <laughs> I, t- I trust. I trust my book club members. You know, if they, they, they had read The Left Hand of Darkness, they knew the standard. 
So look, I suppose there's a bit of a caveat there. You'd read these at your own risk, but those were the recommendations that came through. My personal recommendation is Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea series, which are aimed at, I don't want to say young adults, because I feel like that's a very uh, recent term that's been developed. These were written, I think, across the 19, late 1960s into the 1980s. I think there's about six books in the series, but the first four are the ones I've read, and that is A Wizard of Earthsea, The Tombs of Atuan, The Farthest Shore, and Tehanu. I think you've read these. No, I haven't actually, oh, really? um, but I would now very happily read anything else by Ursula Le Guin because she was so great. Yeah. Well, really. this series is centers around the wizard Ged um, and his coming of age story as he becomes the Archmage of Earthsea, which is an incredibly detailed, beautiful world. But it's also the story of the high priestess Tenar. And there's so there's four books and the first one is from not from Ged's perspective, but it's mainly about him. The second one is all from the perspective of Tenar, though Ged is a, uh, is a main character in it. The Farthest Shore switches back to Ged. And then Tehanu is from Tenar's point of view. And what happens then is that you get, um, again, Ursula Le Guin is exploring kind of a different views of the world that might result from your gender effectively and the roles that you're born in. So they are suitable very much for young people. Um, and in their language, they're quite simple, but I love them. And The Tombs of Atuan was by far my favorite. That's the second book. I think you can read it if you haven't read the first book. Um, it's just really gripping. Mm. So I highly recommend that. I do think it works as a book group book, definitely, because of its exploration of gender. But you could just read it for, for the sheer pleasure. They sound great. And I would recommend, going back to your Alexievich, Chernobyl Prayer which was a much shorter book in which she travelled to Chernobyl in the days after the nuclear explosion there and she interviewed the emergency workers and the army, people who were there trying to lock it down. And it's the same idea of these interviews, but in much shorter form. I think if you wanted a taste of Alexievich, that would be a very good entry point. Andy in my book club had read that before secondhand time and, and he, he thought it was great. Yeah, he really rated it highly. So that's it for today's episode. If you've enjoyed listening, please subscribe to us on iTunes. You'll find us under The Book Club Review. And then send the link to a friend who you think might like it. <laughs> and get them to subscribe too. <laughs> Our next book club book is The Border by Kapka Kasabova. And it's a non-fiction history of the border zone between Bulgaria, Turkey and Greece. And we are reading Margaret Atwood's Hagseed, which is her contemporary retelling of Shakespeare's The Tempest. Thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>